So as it turns out, big daddy government can have a big influence on whether populations are growing or declining. And in this video, we're going to look at the various policies that impact how many babies people have. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. So as you may remember from previous videos, governments watch the growth of their population uh, real close. And if those governments decide that there are just too many dang people and too many mouth holes to feed, then they can pass laws or roll out campaigns known as antinatalist policies, which aim to slow population growth by reducing fertility rates. Oh, and by the way, if you want no guides to follow along with this video, then check the link below. Anyway, there are basically two categories of antinatalist policies. First are voluntary antinatalist policies, which is to say the government offers couples various incentives to have fewer children. For example, in 2018, Egypt hit 100 million in population, and the government there was like, whoa, that is too many mouth holes to feed. So they introduced their Two is Enough media campaign in which they attempted to persuade Egyptians to limit their families to two children. And they also promised financial support to impoverished women and increased access to health care. And so whether the Egyptian population complies is up to them and whether they think those incentives are worth it. In other words, it is voluntary. But second, we have coercive antinatalist policies, which is to say the government actively punishes people for having too many children. For example, in the 1970s, India's government was essentially a dictatorship, and because their population was growing at an incredibly rapid pace, they forcibly sterilized millions of men, making it physically impossible for them to reproduce. But probably the most famous coercive antinatalist push was China's one-child policy. And here, because of China's exploding population numbers in the middle of the 20th century, the government offered both incentives for only having one child and punishments for having more than one child. And those punishments included hefty fines on the lighter side and then forced abortions or female sterilization on the heavier side. And whatever else we could say about it, the one-child policy absolutely worked in reducing the scale of China's population growth until it was removed in 2016. But I should say this antinatalist policy had some stiff consequences as well, including significantly unbalanced sex ratios in favor of males and the problems that come with aging populations. But on the other side of the coin, governments can enact pronatalist policies, which are intended to increase the number of children born, which is to say, increase fertility rates. And usually governments enact these policies because they're getting a little twitchy about the effects of an aging population, not least the need to have enough working age people to fill jobs and keep that economy afloat. Now, pronatalist policies are basically always voluntary because not even big daddy government can force people to, you know, reproduce. And so that means that pronatalist policies usually include things like media campaigns encouraging couples to have more children or generous maternity and paternity leaves from work or tax breaks for couples with more children. And I'm in the mood to give you two examples here because they're kind of hilarious. First, let's visit our friends in Russia. So plagued with negative population growth and a rapidly aging workforce, the Russian government in 2006 decided to make September 12th a national holiday they called the Day of Conception. And I am not making this up. Every year on September 12th, everyone is encouraged to stay home from work and, uh, <clears throat> multiply. And then to further blow your mind, the Russian government has turned this into kind of a game show. Like nine months later on June 12th, the government doles out prizes to families who are having babies. Things like cash prizes and household appliances and even cards. And then second, over in Denmark, the government has been worried about the declining population for decades. And so a travel company launched the Do It For Denmark campaign because apparently people are more likely to multiply on vacation. <laughs> can't make this stuff up. Okay, now the last category of population policies we need to consider are immigration policies. Now remember that having babies is not the only way a population can change because people immigrating or emigrating can also have significant effects as well. So depending on a government's assessment of its population growth, it may choose to introduce policies that allow more immigrants or restrict the flow of immigrants into the country. For example, in the 1950s and 1960s, as Western Europe was recovering from World War II, they experienced an economic boom. However, because of the significantly decreased population due to the staggering amount of deaths in the war, several nations passed policies basically inviting immigrants to come and live and work there, and those folks were known as guest workers. And as a result, the economic boom continued as well as a population increase through immigration. Well, okay, click here to keep reviewing other topics in Unit 2, and click here to grab my video note guides which follow along with all my videos. Like if you hate reading your textbook but you still want to do well in your class, these sweet bippies are for you. So I'll catch you on the flip-flop. I'm Lerout.